In the workshop, a craftsman is often involved with a wide range of jobs in which many skills and principles are combined. Here's a typical example. This steel bush, which locates the lead screw on the compound slide of a lathe, has been reported faulty. For some reason or other, it's become very badly worn. The result is a loose fit between the bush and the shaft. As there's no time to order a spare part, a replacement has to be made. First, the craftsman makes a sketch of the bush, drawn in such a way that any craftsman would be able to understand it. It's drawn in a standard way. For example, the outside edge of this small diameter is represented by a dotted line. That means it's hidden detail in this particular view of the component. But one sketch can't show all the details of features such as this, so it's necessary to make another sketch from a different point of view. Every feature must be recorded, including this undercut just behind the small diameter. Here's another feature, a chamfered edge around the hole into which the shaft fits. Also, in this part of the bush, there's an oil hole. The position of this hole must be shown not only in relation to the two retaining holes, but also in relation to the front face of the bush. The next job is to get the dimensions of the bush. For this, a micrometer is used. Can you think of the reason for this choice of instrument? First, the large diameter. This particular micrometer measures in excess of 50 millimeters, so 50 must be added on to the final reading. On the sketch, dimensions are also added in a standard way. For example, the outlines are extended to show where the dimension refers. Next, the length of the large diameter is measured. On the sketch, the dimension is again recorded in millimeters. The third dimension is the combined length of both the small and large diameters. And once again, of course, the dimension is in the same unit. So far, so good, but what about the diameter of the hole for the shaft? Remember, the bush is worn, so the hole is oversized. To get the required dimension, it's necessary to measure the diameter of the shaft. Of course, when machining, the hole will have to be made a bit bigger than this to get a small clearance fit. One other dimension still required is this outside diameter. As this locates with the bore in the compound slide, the dimension that's needed is the diameter of the bore. This is where a telescopic gauge comes in useful. There's now sufficient information in the two sketches for a craftsman to make a replacement. First, a material must be chosen with suitable properties for the job. Steel is one such material. Can you think of any others? The prepared blank is held in a self-centering chuck ready for turning. The craftsman sets the blank so that it's as near concentric with the spindle center line as possible. As restraint along the center line relies entirely on friction, the jaws must hold the work as firmly as possible. Next, a suitable cutting tool must be chosen. 
This one is called a light turning and facing tool. From this point of view, it has a back rake angle and a front clearance angle. If the tool is viewed end on, two other angles can be seen. A side rake angle and a side clearance angle. Now before cutting, the tool must be set on center. One way of doing this is to line it up with a center in the tailstock. A supply of cutting fluid is essential. It has the job of conducting heat away from the tool and work and of reducing friction between the tool face and the chip. The first operation involves generating a flat surface which will be exactly at right angles to the spindle center line. This is done by using the cross slide to feed the tool into the work. Next, the overall diameter of the work must be reduced. At this stage, it's only necessary to get the work roughly down to size. Because of its geometry, the same cutting tool can be used, but this time it's moved parallel to the spindle center line. Roughing is the process of removing as much material as possible in the shortest possible time. For checking measurements at this stage, external calipers are sufficiently accurate. Now the diameter of part of the bush needs to be very much smaller, 19.4 millimeters. For a rough cut, this diameter will be machined to 21 millimeters. Once again, the cross slide is used to feed the tool into the work. For roughing, that's got it down to a suitable diameter. But is this part of the bush long enough? In the finished component, its length will be the difference between these two dimensions. That's 5.13 millimeters. So far, it's just over 3.5 millimeters long. For a rough cut, it needs to be two millimeters longer. It should be possible to remove the remaining material in one more cut. Next, the hole for the shaft has to be generated to just the right size. This is done in several stages. First, the component is center drilled. On a lathe, the center drill is mounted in the tailstock. That means it's on the same center as the tool used to generate all the other surfaces. Once center drilled, a twist drill can be used. Now the diameter of the drill is actually less than the diameter of the hole required. Can you think why? To machine the hole to the right size, a different cutting tool is used, a boring tool. This is clamped in a tool holder. Before cutting, the tool is set on center, again by lining it up with the center in the tailstock. A surface gauge can be used for this. The gauge locates exactly on the slideway of the lathe, which can be used as a datum for transferring this height from one end of the slideway to the other.
The boring tool is fed into the work parallel to the spindle center line. Let's look at the cutting action from the other end of the hole. Can you see the rake and clearance angles? After each cut, the size of the hole is very carefully measured. Once it reaches the diameter of the shaft, the hole must be made just a little bit bigger to allow for a small clearance fit between it and the shaft. For the next operation, the work must be taken out of the chuck and remounted the other way round. This is necessary in order to rough turn the rest of the work down to the same diameter and also to rough face the work to a suitable overall length. All that remains is to machine the component to exactly the right dimensions. This can be done by turning between centers. The chuck is replaced by a driving plate and center. In the tailstock, a revolving center can be used. The work has been mounted on a taper mandrel, which is located between the centers. To drive the work round, a driving dog has been fitted to the headstock end of the mandrel. It's now only a matter of using the right cutting tool, sufficient cutting fluid, and a suitable speed and feed. Now, here are two things for you to think about. What advantage is there in finish turning between centers, and why doesn't the work slip on the mandrel? The first stage in the manufacture of this component was turning. The next stage is to drill the two retaining holes. The position of these holes must first be determined on the worn component. A one way of doing this involves finding a drill that just fits one of the holes. All that's needed now is another drill the same size. Using a micrometer, the distance between the two outside edges of the holes can now be determined. From this and one other dimension, it's possible to calculate the distance between the two centers of the holes. That's this distance. The other dimension needed is the diameter of the hole. Five point five millimeters. Here's that dimension on the drawing. The other hole is the same size. Now to get the distance between their centers, we must subtract from the left-hand dimension the radius of each hole. That is, we must subtract a total of five point five millimeters, which gives the required dimension as forty four point four five millimeters. The only other hole to be drilled is the oil hole. With the aid of a suitable drill, the position of this hole must be determined in relation to the two retaining holes. For this, the bush is located in a V block. Using a surface gauge, the bush is rotated until the two retaining holes are seen to be horizontal with the surface table. Can you think of any other way of doing this? A 
And once horizontal, a suitable form of protractor can then be used to obtain the angle between the axis of the hole and the surface of the table. The only other information that's required is the size of the hole. Since the drill is a good fit, the diameter of the hole is the same as the diameter of the drill. Six millimeters. The turned component can now be marked out, ready for drilling. Now, this is done on the front face, which has previously been blued. To get the position of the centers of the two retaining holes, this overall height must first be determined. On this combination square, we can estimate to about half a millimeter. From this reading, we must subtract the radius of the bush. That's half this distance, 28.37 millimeters. On the combination square, that would be taken as 28.5 millimeters. This will give the height of the center line of the bush relative to the surface table. Next, the bush must be rotated through 90 degrees. Now, the centers of the two retaining holes lie on a pitch circle whose radius is half this distance. That's 22.23 millimeters. This must now be added on to the center height reading within the accuracy of the scale. The position of one of the centers is now determined. By rotating the work through 180 degrees, the position of the other can then be marked off. So far, so good. But what about the position of the oil hole? To mark this out, the bush is first rotated through a previously determined angle. Then, with the surface gauge still set at the center height, another center line is marked off, both on the face of the bush and on the cylindrical surface. Before drilling, the work must be center punched. It's then restrained in a vise with V-shaped jaws. Can you think why parallel jaws would be unsuitable here? Well, next, the work must be lined up with the drill. The vise can then be clamped to the machine table. Once drilled, the hole must be counterbored to accommodate the head of the retaining screw. Finally, there's the oil hole, which must also be counterbored. Using a square, the position of this hole, as marked out, can be lined up with the drill. Before the job is complete, the craftsman must check that the replacement part meets all the design requirements. Is it a good fit? Is the oil hole in the right place? Do the retaining holes locate correctly? If so, the job is finished.